Thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, in addition to, to thanking everyone, I, I also want to thank um, Don Coleman from Chariot Solutions, who's uh, the reason I'm here. I met Don uh, a few years ago uh, because of some of the open source repos that he'd published through uh, Chariot, and we became co-authors on a book about NFC. So um, whether you like this talk or not, um, it's at least in part Don's, uh, Don's fault that I'm here. Um, so, uh, as we mentioned, I teach at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU. Um, it's a two-year graduate program, and this is the view from my office. And it was started in 1979 by this woman here, Red Burns. Um, she's a filmmaker, and she was inspired to uh, make the place when she saw this camera, the port pack camera. Now, in the mid-'70s, this was relatively inexpensive and relatively portable. And Red saw it as something that was going to change people's relationship to media. She believed that they could go from having a passive consuming role to an active participation role. So she started what she called the, Arts, Altini, oh, bleh, the Alternative Media Center um, at the time, which later became ITP. And her vision is really still our founding principle, uh, that basically when people have access to technologies, and the knowledge of how to use them, they'll move from a passive role to an active role. And it's a pattern we've seen over the years with many, many different uh, generations of media and technology. Uh, here's a basic rundown of uh, who we are by the numbers. Um, we take people from a lot of different disciplines, from the arts, technology, psychology, marketing, sciences, design, architecture, and so forth. Um, we're really looking for a mix of disciplines. Um, we also really try very hard to strive for gender parity because we find it changes the mix of things radically when you do that. Um, we know that the ideal student is probably around 27. Uh, she's usually somebody who's a few years into her professional career. Um, she's got enough work experience to see how things work and is still fresh enough to believe that things can actually change for the better. And because students are coming from all these different backgrounds, they don't know how to talk to each other. They've got no, no shared assumptions. Um, and so they all look at problems differently, and they have to learn a common shared language. Uh, they have to develop that. And one of the big things they have to do is they have to learn how to relearn, uh, excuse me, they have to relearn how to ask naive questions again. One of the problems when we all share a discipline is that we assume everybody knows the same things we know, and so we call some questions stupid questions. We have to reteach students that there are no stupid questions. We teach them programming and electronics and media production and uh, media management all in their first semester. And it's a lot to take in. Um, and we have to get them up to speed fast. And um, play becomes really important to that. This project is a flight simulator, in case you were wondering. Um, we find that when people play, they let down their guard and they discover things they wouldn't discover otherwise, necessarily. Um, and we encourage students to be generous in sharing their ideas with one another. We tell them that ideas are cheap, and they get better when you try them out on others, when you iterate on them. Uh, it's deciding on which ideas you want to act on, and executing them takes a lot of work. We're a little unusual uh, in that uh, students own all of their own intellectual property at ITP. They generally don't work on sponsored research. They, they work on their own thing. So when they walk out the door, they can start a startup. They can do whatever they want to with it. At ITP, I manage uh, what we call the physical computing curriculum. And um, our aim in those classes is, uh, as we just mentioned, to teach people how to expand the range of human physical expression that computers can respond to. And we start by asking the question, what do people do physically when they're using these systems? The, uh, we started teaching this class around 1992. And the original and perhaps the best explanation still comes from a woman named Joy Mountford, who was at Apple at the time. And she said, you know, it's not really how we see the computer that matters. It's how the computer sees us. The computer's perception of us is limited by which of our actions it can sense and what sensors it's got to do that. And it used to be difficult to describe this in everyday life. But nowadays, I can say to people, it's what things like the Kinect make possible. And they get it, or at least enough that we can start a conversation. Now, many of the good tools right now for doing physical computing are coming from the gaming world. Um, but many of them are gesturally based, like the Kinect, uh, and have intangible interfaces. So we also teach students how to build uh, tangible interfaces and to really um, revel in all the rich sensory feedback and uh, all of our tactile ability to learn, not just our intellectual ability to learn. So what do we do with all this once people are building things? Well, we do a few things. Um, sometimes we make expressive works. 
Uh, Matthew Richard was a painter when he came to ITP, and he was really interested in color field painting, things like Mark Rothko and so forth. And he wanted to make moving color field paintings. So uh, we taught him enough mechanics and electronics so that he could start to build things like this piece here. Um, expressive works can be works of art, but they're not always that. Sometimes expressive works are political works or instructive works. Um, this piece here, for example, is actually designed to teach you about circadian rhythms. Um, it's a clock. And what happens is, once a day, squirrel takes its head off, puts its head back on, and there you go. Um, but it makes you think about things in a slightly different way, by seeing things like this around you. Primarily, though, when we talk about these kinds of uh, expressive works, these are works that draw attention to themselves to start a conversation, right? So we also make instrumental works, and whether they're, uh, w sorry, ex instrumental works, you know, expressive works will draw attention to themselves, but um, tools or instruments allow us to forget them and focus on the action that they're enabling. So whether you're talking about something like a musical instrument like this, or an everyday tool like this, like this chair and head mounted PS3 controller that was made for this young man with uh, muscular dystrophy, Tools are really things that let us just get to the activity. And if you've made a tool well, you forget about it. If you're paying attention to the tool, it hasn't been made well enough yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes we make tools for social change. Uh, this is a mobile application uh, for helping workers in crisis areas, whether for natural disasters or war, to do family tracing and reunification. We teach a class with UNICEF, and this uh, project was developed out of that. <coughs> And I mention these different contexts of expressiveness versus instruments and so forth because, uh, again, we don't have a common context among the students, and so we have to set that context. A project like this, for example, will be seen very differently in a toy design class than it might be in a data representation class, but it might grow out of either one. In fact, this one did grow out of both a data rep class and a toy design class. Um, <coughs> the uh, shape of the wires is giving you a, uh, an idea of the rising childhood obesity in the world. This is designed for uh, doctor's offices for kids to play with. So a little background on myself before I came to this. Uh, I came from a theater background. I was doing stage and lighting, making people look lonely and blue a lot. And um, I find that a lot of that background has actually influenced my current work because um, it's all about what the actor does ultimately, whether it's on stage or whether we call that actor a user. And you can't tell an actor what to do. You can suggest actions, but you have to work with their motivations and their intentions, um, whether you're designing for stage or whether you're designing for interface. Uh, as an undergraduate, I was simultaneously an IBM Watson scholar and a Lee Liberace scholar. And I like to say that the two of them are probably in hell vying uh, for my soul. Um, I usually also tell undergraduates that when it comes down to it, thinking about technology, Liberace is probably the better role model than, uh, than Watson is. Um, yeah, he dressed better and he didn't sell technology to Hitler. Um, <coughs> so anyway, before I started teaching, um, I built a few interactive projects. I worked with Diller and Scafetti Architects on this project they did for the Swiss International Expo in 2002. Uh, they were building a cloud on a lake. And as part of that, when people came to the cloud, they wanted them to wear these raincoats that would express their antipathy or affinity for each other as they passed each other in the cloud. The idea was, if you were like me, our jackets would light up red. And if you were unlike me, our jackets might light up green. So my job was to design the whole system for that, figure out how we were going to make it happen, research the technologies, and so forth. And um, we got that all designed and built. This is what the building actually looked like once it was built. Um, and then. Um, as it happens with expos, we lost $12 million and all the interactive stuff got cut. You win some, you lose some. Um, this is a project that actually did get finished. Uh, the uh, Gay Men's Health Crisis and the Museum of the City of New York did an exhibit on the history of AIDS in New York uh, back in uh, 2000. And I built a series of video portraits for it. These were um, small candles in a votive candle stand. Each one would be flickering gently when you walked up to it. There'd be a button in front of it. This is the kind of thing you see in museums nowadays all the time. Um, and it's, it's a fairly typical example of, of, I guess, what I would call safe physical interaction. It was a real lesson for me in politics at the time, though, because we worked out the optimal ergonomic arrangement for all these things. And then we had to rearrange all the candles because the stakeholders, the folks from GMHC, uh, the various activists, 
wanted their candles rearranged in a particular way to show who was more important. It had nothing to do with the user interface. It had to do with the politics of the situation. So you have to play everything into these projects as you go. I also did a project uh, with my colleague Chris Bregler, who's an expert in, um, in uh, motion capture. This is a little dark, forgive me called Squidball. It's probably the largest motion capture rig ever built. Uh, we did it for a SIGGRAPH in 2004. And basically, you've got these four-foot uh, balls that are motion capture tags bouncing around an auditorium of 4,000 people. And um, as they're hitting the balls, they're destroying virtual targets on the screen there. With all of these projects, uh, again, the thinking in them was really around the actor and their intentions and their motivations. And uh, that helped drive the necessary technologies and physical interfaces we built. So back to teaching this. When we're teaching this, the key technical elements we talk to students about are, are the sensing, how you know where the person is, the uh, communication between your sensing computer and your multimedia computer or whatever, the responsive code you're writing, and the actuation, how you make the, um, the fist hit the hand there. Uh, this is a drawing from my colleague, Dan O'Sullivan, who started the physical computing program. Um, to do this, we introduced them to microcontrollers. And uh, probably most of you know, microcontrollers are very small, bare-bones computers. They can get them for less than a dollar a piece these days. They have no physical interface. And you attach circuits like sensors and switches and motors and lights to them in order to build any interface you want. Now, traditionally, microcontrollers were the domain of experienced electrical engineers. And teaching them was a bit of a challenge. This is uh, what our early projects looked like at ITP. And um, you know, trying to get people to build in a in a um, in a rigorous way when they're coming at it from all kinds of different creative ways is a little bit of a challenge. So about ten years ago, I was invited by some colleagues in Italy to co-found a company called Arduino. They were teaching at a similar school in in Ivrea, Italy, at the time, and. Um, Arduino is a system for teaching people to program microcontrollers that's designed for, for our audience, for, for non-technicians. Um, and our goal is to get people making electronic things fast. We're an open source hardware company, which means that we publish the board and the plans um, and the software all on our site, in addition to selling the board. So if you want to make your own derivative of it, you can. Uh, we see people making their own versions of it all the time. There's several dozen. Uh, derivatives out there that are both our cooperators and our competitors at this point. Uh, it's really kind of exciting to see that happen. But when we talk about Arduino, we're usually talking about four things. It's not just the board. There is the hardware, of course. Uh, there's also the software, which is cross-platform and, again, written for a uh, beginning audience. Cross-platform and microcontrollers at the time was a big deal um, because everything was done in the Windows world and that was it. Um, we've started to change that, fortunately. Um, we also have written a ton of examples for hands-on learning. Um, just simple things that show you how to build little small things so you get started. Uh, because we find a lot of time people need not just that imagination, but that first uh, thing that blinks the LED. In, in microcontroller worlds, the equivalent of hello world is blinking the LED. Once they blink the LED, it's all over. And finally, there's the community, which builds some really amazing things uh, to kind of show off what's possible. And just to give you a few examples of that, this is one of my uh, favorite projects from early on. Um, you can't hear it too well here, but, uh, oh, I should be plugging in the audio. Well, regardless, it's a set of stairs that as you go up and down the stairs, plays a note. Um, simple piece. Some of you may have seen a piece by Fun Theory that went viral on the net like this a couple years ago. This is about four years before that. Um, and it was built really when we were still just knocking the bugs out of the alpha on Arduino. Uh, and it was installed at the Pompidou Center in Paris. So the team that took this on was really taking a lot of risk. They had no idea whether the technology was going to work. They had thousands of people coming through, but it worked out beautifully. Um, this is a project from a user whose mother uh, was starting to show signs of dementia, and he wanted to make sure that she was taking her pills properly. So he built her a little reader that would read the pill containers and tell her whether she was taking the right pills. She could add new pills, and um, it would keep track of what she should be taking and when she should be taking them. He didn't design it for a whole large audience. He designed it for one person. And that's actually kind of a, a big deal in these projects to me. Um, this is a project from some students at the University, OCAD University in Toronto. Uh, it's a Kegel organ. Um, 
you uh, take that thing and you insert it in your uh, vagina or wherever else you want to put it. And the more you squeeze, the louder the note or the higher the note goes that it plays. Uh, if you Google this one on, on the internet, you'll find the creators of it playing Mary Had a Little Lamb, I believe. Um, <laughs> so what we're aiming for with uh, Arduino and, and ITP as well is an idea of technological literacy. We're not trying to create engineers or software programmers necessarily. Um, the technologies we're talking about are part of everybody's lives at this point, and they affect how we do our work, whether or not we're in technology. But the more we understand them, the more control we have over how they affect our lives. We can actually have a say rather than have it dictated to us. Um, now, if you think about language, everybody uses language. We use it sometimes very plainly and symptomly just to describe things uh, or as a way, tool to convey information. Sometimes we use it expressively uh, when we tell stories or sing or recite poems. Um, sometimes we use it playfully to make puns or tell jokes. And these are all different contexts for the use of language, just as we have different contexts for the use of tech. And when we're using language casually or non-professionally, we leave words out, we use the wrong words sometimes, uh, we forgive each other a lot for not using language as precisely as we need to necessarily. But there are professional users of language. You think about writers or journalists or translators or diplomats. These are people who we expect to understand the rules of language much more precisely, and we expect them to use it very precisely and carefully. You're negotiating a treaty around, say, nuclear arms proliferation. You want to use language correctly. Um, but when your writer head's friends hit you up the head with uh, strunk and white, it's really kind of annoying. Every time you, say, dangle a participle or split an infinitive, you really don't want that. The same thing is true in tech. When programmers slap somebody upside the head with Kernigan and Ritchie every time they put their braces in the wrong place, or when EEs you know, hit you with Horowitz and Hill every time you use the wrong resistor, it can actually discourage people from learning about new tech. And this is one of the things we're trying to change. Now, engineers aren't by nature as forgiving of casual uses of engineering as writers are of casual use of language. Um, and of course, we all know this one well. If you go into a programming forum in the net, you're generally going to get ex be expected to know the right way before you ask your question. You're going to get told off. There are good reasons for that, because if you and do something wrong in engineering, you might kill people. We don't want to kill people. Um, but I still think that we can change this. And I'm glad to see it's starting to happen on the net that we're changing from this mentality a little bit to this mentality. Um, it's something we're trying to encourage everywhere we possibly can. And it's no surprise that we're seeing this happen in the web programming world first. If you think about it, it's a whole hell of a lot easier now to write a web server than it was 20 years ago. And um, it's not surprising in a way that people might learn to program first on the web because it is part of our everyday life now. We can imagine what we might do with programming because we all use the web, right? Um, it's also because we've got languages like Python and, and Ruby and JavaScript that are much more flexible than C in, in learning to program, right? Um, this is also the case we start to see some of these graphic tools like Tembu's Twyla or uh, IBM's Node-RED. Um, we're actually starting to abstract programming into process flow, which is great to see. We're not there yet in hardware. Um, even with some of the best tools out there like Scratch or Scratch for Arduino, you know, these are being used by kids all the time. And they, in some ways, seem to make programming simpler, but they don't. They actually just abstract away the, the syntax. They don't abstract away the structural complexity. And that's something we still need to work on. Now, I'm pleased to see we're seeing some changes. A couple of recent boards have come out. This is MicroPython board. And uh, my new all-time favorite, Esperino here, has the worst possible name in the world. Um, there are 30 Italian words for coffee, and they had to mash up espresso and Arduino. It drives me nuts. But um, what's great about both of these boards is that they're running scripting languages without an operating system. So you've got Python running on here on the bare metal. You've got JavaScript running on there on the bare metal. And um, so all of a sudden, we can start to think about expressive languages. Esperino is particularly impressive because he rewrote the whole thing mostly not using garbage collection, so he gets very consistent timing on his physical I.O. Um, ultimately, what I'm aiming for is that we, we don't need to make better programmers. We need to make programming better for everyone. <laughs> now, I've talked about code literacy and with Arduino a little bit of electronics literacy, but there's one more literacy I want to talk about here. And um, that's construction or fabrication literacy. 
Now, if Arduino was the port pack for electronics, then digital fabrication is the port pack for physical design. Uh, digital fabrication tools make it possible for people with little experience or training to make precision mechanisms and structures. And for us, they've changed the way we're able to teach because you're not just making electronics and code, you're putting that in a housing, you're giving it a body for people to react with their own body. And tools like laser cutters and mills, uh, CNC tools that cut, are actually some of the more important digital fab tools to us. Um, and as you can see, we've got three of them running. One of them is always out of order, it seems like, because they're always in use. Um, why I think these tools are important is because they don't totally automate the process of building. Now, IKEA has known for years that human beings are bad at cutting and shaping, but they're good at assembling. And CNC fab tools like these particular ones, I think, do that particularly well. If you think about 3D printers, one of my difficulty with 3D printers, and the reason I don't see them get as used as much in building projects is because they assume they're going to automate the whole process. Well, that's actually not how we build things for the most part. You've probably seen plenty of people's 3D printed heads by now, but um, these days my favorite tool is actually this. It's the Other Mill um, by a company called Other Mill. Uh, actually, Other Engineering, I think it is. But um, they made a, a small CNC mill. It's only about $2,000. Uh, sits on a desktop. And um, they really wanted to aim at an audience much like the audience I deal with, everyday people. Um, they uh, also made their software much simpler to work with. And they did something that was kind of controversial in the hardware engineering community. They wrote their software for OS X and Linux first. Um, they got a lot of trouble from their engineers, but they got a huge audience as a result. So um, what's great about this tool is that within about 10, 15 minutes of learning it, you can be building things like this out of metal. Uh, this is a motor mount, in case you were wondering. Or you can be milling circuit boards, like this Arduino derivative. Um, took me about five minutes to go from getting the thing set up to, to milling this thing out. I have to give my colleague Ben Light credit uh, here. He's been teaching uh, and making tutorials at ITP about the other mill that are making it really indispensable for us. Now that tool's really interesting, but it gets even more interesting when you combine it with this machine. This machine is a tool that allows you to place and solder millimeter scale electronic components by hand. Um, and to do it one by one. It's great because normally this is done by what we call pick and place robots. They'll put a thousand components on a board at a time and it's all totally automated and you never really see how it works. This one lets you do that, guide the robot one component at a time to learn how it's done. You can change your mistakes, you can do all kinds of things like that. Um, again, it doesn't automate the whole process, it just automates the hard part. And these tools are still not consumer level. Um, but they're getting closer. They've reached desktop scale, and they've reached small business affordable, and those are steps that are forward. But for me, what makes these interesting to an audience like this is that they're connected devices. They can be programmed with all of the tools you're used to, and there's no reason you can't make your own interface if you don't like the interfaces that are built for them. One of our resident researchers, Andy Sigler, did this with this Roland mill, for example. He wrote a program called Nodella in Node.js. He, he realized that the Roland was just running off a of TCP, so he made a simpler interface uh, to do circuit boards, which is the main thing we do on that bill. Um, the original software was written for Windows only, and uh, it was kind of a user nightmare, but Nodella runs in a browser, does everything we need it to do for our purposes. It doesn't do everything the mill can do, but it gets the job done very, very well. I'm excited to see a lot of the tools like that, like Node.js, Serial Port, uh, and some of these libraries that allow you to start to access hardware with software, with traditional web and software tools. Because it means that if you're coming at this with just a little bit of, a little bit of uh, say, HTML and JavaScript, you can start to build new interfaces for the devices around you. You can start to say, I want to customize this for myself. On the hardware side of this, uh, the Arduino Union is one of our new boards, and this is designed for this. It's, it's a bit like some of the other boards you may have seen. It's a combined embedded Linux board there with Wi-Fi and an embedded microcontroller. So it can do the real-time things like controlling motors down here and the network things uh, in Linux up there. You may have seen the Raspberry Pi or the BeagleBone. This is similar to those. What we tried to do, because we'd seen it happen so much in the Raspberry Pi world, is we just jammed the microcontroller and the Linux controller onto the same board. Now, my colleague Clay Shirky, 11 years ago, um, 
wrote about the rise of software applications that didn't scale, but that solved one particular group's problem very well. Um, he talked about situated software. And it perplexed him at first, but he started to realize that in various organizations, people were writing their own software because they had you, their own needs. And the tools we were making on the web made that possible. And he and I speculated at the time whether or not there would be such a thing as situated hardware. And I think with things like the Yoon and the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone Black there, we're starting to see that become a reality, which is great. For me, though, it's, it's less impressive to think about these in terms of the, um, the commercial applications than some of the personal applications. Uh, my partner for Christmas this year asked me if we could have our Christmas tree so that every time you ring a bell on the tree, an angel would get its wings, just like in It's a Wonderful Life. And um, so with a yun and a string of programmable lights and a tin bell, I was able to finally make that happen for her. Uh, so you'll see that when she tinkles the bell here, hopefully, if she decides to do it, there we go. Angel got its wings right there. And you know, there's nothing like having a, a very personal user smile and really get the application to make you feel like you're satisfied in your work. Um, but there are more practical applications as well. Uh, this is a project from Matthew Epler. Uh, Matthew came to ITP as a filmmaker, and he still is. And a lot of the work he does is collecting rare footage from around the world, sometimes war footage, sometimes uh, entertainment footage, all kinds of things, and digitizing it so that it's archived. Um, a lot of the projects he works on are very low budget. And so professional tools for digitizing are not necessarily always affordable to him. So with a Raspberry Pi and a few motors and a DSLR, he threw together this rig here uh, for about a tenth the cost that a, a traditional rig would cost him. And then he published the plans for it open source so that other people could do the same thing. What was great is in the process, he stumbled across um, the problem that the jitter you get from old film often causes a lot of instability in the image. So he wrote some really nice image stabilizing software that runs on the Raspberry Pi so that he could get much smoother video uh, output from it. And Matt doesn't describe himself as a programmer. He still describes himself as a filmmaker. He just happens to use programming as a communication tool like anything else he uses. One last thing I want to talk about here, um, and it's the idea of remote hubs. Now, I've been teaching people to build connected devices or networked objects or whatever you want to call them since about 2001. And about the most common project that comes up in all of these classes is, uh, and I've seen this in other people's classes as well, is what I call the remote hug. A remote hug is generally a pair of objects that are owned by two people who already have a relationship. And the idea is that when I'm thinking of you, I do something on my object and it signals to your object that I'm thinking of you. If I take out my cell phone and tap on it, the heart might start to beat and you go, oh, Tom's thinking about me, that's nice, right? Um, these things don't convey data. They perform a social function. They are supporting phatic communication over distance. In fact, reduced to data, the gesture of a remote hug is meaningless. They really derive their power from the, the meaning that the behavior evokes, not from what the data that it conveys. Um, sometimes they, they get their meaning from the shared history you might have around these objects. These two are, are photo frames owned by a grandmother and a grandson. Um, I don't think remote hugs are scalable as a product. I've only ever seen one company ever try, and they went out of business in about six months. Um, but I've seen them come up over and over and over again. And I think the fact that they come up so often, that they are such a common project in everything from design schools to engineering schools and, and every other school I've seen that teaches this stuff, means that we have a widespread interest in phatic communication just as we do in unmediated life. And this relates to something else. We know that the World Wide Web got really interesting when it started to support the ability for users to generate content, for them to participate in the story rather than just consuming it. We know that networks can support and encourage cooperation. We've seen that again and again, right? Um, and we know that people will often do it for even altruistic reasons. But if you contrast that with the current vision of the Internet of Things, you'll see we got a bit of a problem. Kevin Ashton, who originally came up with the term in 99, wrote this essay in 2009, and he said that if computers had, uh, if we had computers that knew about things uh, with using data they gathered without any help from us, italics mine, we would be able to track and count everything and greatly reduce waste, lost, and cost. He said, we need to empower computers with their own means of gathering information so they can see, hear, and smell the world for themselves in all its random glory. 
Now, I agree with him on that last part, because that really enables all kind of expressiveness. But I think that first part he got very terribly wrong. Because again, we're not just interested in using these tools for data gathering. We're using them for communication already. And we should expand that into the physical world. I've been learning a lot about this from a game I play with my class every year. I, beat, I build a version of networked Pong. And I tell them they have to build a physical Pong controller. And so they build all kinds of crazy things. There's an ironing board there. The guy in the back's got a windmill. Um, one group built a seesaw here. Um, and what I found is I changed the game over time from one of competition to cooperation. Nowadays, the balls fall from the top. They've all got a paddle on the screen. And they get a point. The whole group gets a point for every new paddle the ball bounces off of. They don't see their scores until the end. What I found is that they play longer now that it's a cooperative game. And they spend a lot of time talking with each other in a side channel about how to play the game well. What's happened is they actually really matter not just about the game, but about the style. Now, this is one of my favorite controllers of all, uh, speaking of style. It comes from a guy named Andrew Schneider. He's got an old analog TV there, and taped over those two yellow boxes are two photo cells attached to a network microcontroller there. And then he ripped off his shirt, and he started running around, and his pasty white body was uh, the trigger for the photo cells there. Um, what we really found, again, is that spontaneity of physical expression is a big part of this game. And players care as much about style as they do about skill. But our current interfaces, they support a lot of spontaneity when it comes to purchase or verbal expression. But we're still far behind in building systems that support spontaneous physical expression over networks. The IoT's core values are sitting over here right now around automation and data collection. But I actually think the more fertile ground is over there in interaction and expression, as I say. I'll leave you with one last story here. This is a story about Justin Lang. Justin came to ITP, and he, he uh, was in physical computing the first time. He didn't want to take it. Um, but when we told him what he had to do, he said, OK. He built a, a project for his father here. His father's a guitarist, and he'd lost partial motion in, in his uh, right hand there, or excuse me, his left hand, much like me at the moment. Um, and so uh, I really had him work a lot on user testing, user observation with his dad. Drove his dad nuts with all the user questions he asked him. Um, but at the end of the day, he actually was able to make this guitar. And when his dad finally played it for the first time, he was able to play as expressively as he had when he had full motion. Um, and of course, as you imagine, Justin broke down crying. Um, the lesson really learned in all of that is that the things we make are less important than the relationships they enable. And that's the thing I think we really want to focus on. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And take any questions and answers at that point. Questions, comments? While you're thinking about it, I'll also just put in a, a quick plug here. Um, for my slide control, I've been using one of these little TI sensor tags. They're not actually designed for slide control. But um, again, this is Don's fault. He taught me all about Bluetooth low energy. And I thought, oh, this is cool. I wonder if I can control Keynote with it, and uh, got it working fairly quickly. Um, so he's doing a session on Bluetooth LE later on in the day. I would definitely recommend it. Yeah? So the first thing I've always had is, um, your comment I've always had for me was uh, bridging the controller with alternating current. Most of the things that I want to do with it involve uh, alternating current, but I don't have much on that kind of so that scares me. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's any plans to sort of bridge that gap Sure. So the question was, um, you know, dealing with Arduino and alter alternating current, how do you see to it that you don't kill yourself, basically? Right? Um, actually, there are a lot of tools out there right now for that. There's, there's uh, a wonderful one called the Power Switch Tail that basically looks like a small power tail. It's got two wires coming out of it. One's 5 volts, one's ground. Put it into your Arduino board, turn on and off the sockets with it. Um, they also make one called something uh, like the Power Switch PWM Tail or something like that that basically lets you dim uh, the stuff as well. That's one of the things that's really been kind of interesting to see is all these ancillary products that have grown up as a result. Um, there's also a number of uh, networked power controllers now that I think are equally exciting. Don't even need an Arduino, just go straight to them from a scripting language. Okay. Any others? Yeah. Is this on? Hello? Yep. Uh, I, this isn't really a question, it's more of a comment. Um, 
I just want to say thank you for um, encouraging a community of openness. And I, just like during your talk, um, you would say things like, um, yeah, so this thing isn't really ready yet, or, or like you've been building this thing and it doesn't quite work yet. And I just think that's a, um, a really good attitude to have. And I, I think something that we should all share is openness in our community, trying to help other people um, develop their skills the best that they can. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think no, nothing's ever really finished, so you might as well just keep saying it's not really quite ready yet. Right? <laughs> How many people have software out there that they're selling that's still in a zero point release? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that comes up pretty commonly. Anytime you present one particular uh, dialectic, people are going to try and oppose it in some way. <coughs> the one rule, <coughs> excuse me, the one rule I have in class is you must not hurt people or animals. Um, and yet every year somebody wants to shock people, right? <laughs> um, and every year I'm like, no, you cannot kill people. It's not allowed. Um, but actually one of the more interesting ones that's going on right now uh, Pedro Galvao is doing a project that is actually the second of the times I've seen this. He's building a device uh, that is a distributed Wi-Fi device designed for protest. Uh, the idea being that these devices will um, set up a, a shared ad hoc network to keep the protesters in touch with each other while simultaneously creating uh, DDoSs on the servers of the company or organization in protest. and. Um, What's really kind of interesting and gratifying about this project is he's building it basically on a yun at this point. But I saw the same project uh, from a student uh, in 2002. And at the time, his project was mostly theoretical because we didn't have good Wi-Fi controllers at the time. We, you know, he was, had this Ethernet controller. And I'm like, hey, so I'm going to be in a protest with Ethernet running out the door? <laughs> um, he's like, no, no, I'm just, it's a thought experiment. But it's nice to see that over time, you see sometimes these thought experiments move from that to something that could actually become a reality. I wonder if that, yeah. Can you speak to the speed of new sensors arriving? Because I've been playing with our readers for a few years, and now it seems that there's all these new sensors with the cell hours and all the chips with gyros and everything else. Yeah. Is that, where are we in the spectrum of, of new sensors coming available, or are we accelerating, or are we uh, I think a lot of that is, um, well, basically what's happened over the last 10, 15 years is you've seen a lot of sensor development because, first of all, <clears throat> as chip manufacturers are finding Moore's Law slowing down, they're looking for other things to do with silicon, right? <clears throat> and second of all, you see various industries um, will drive things. Like the reason we're seeing so many cheap accelerometers right now has a lot to do with airbags because the car industry... Uh, had it mandated that they needed to put in airbags, and in order to trigger an airbag, they needed a sensor to do that, so they used accelerometers. So as a result, accelerometers fell in price, and once they started to fall in price, mobile phone companies went, hmm, maybe we'll put those in ours too. So we saw them fall in price even more. Now, we're starting to see that with other sensors too. You're seeing it with gas sensors and temperature sensors and so forth as well. Um, this thing very gratuitously has an infrared contactless temperature sensor, so I could tell you his temperature right now if I wanted to. Not because it's necessary, but because it's cheap for TI to do that. So um, I think we, we sort of reached a, a, a quick peak with it, and now we're starting to see a bit of leveling off just because the range of sensors hasn't changed as much. I think what we hopefully are going to see uh, now is some more nuance around the use and filtering of sensor data. Um, what we're seeing a lot of is here, the sensor works, just do it. And nobody ever tells you how to go from accelerometer to measuring my gait, for example. But now people are starting to embed those kind of algorithms in the sensor silicon itself. So that's hopefully where we're going. Yeah. So following up on that, let's imagine that the Apple Watch and wearables like that are going to be a big hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that and, and the privacy issues around that? 
Well, I think that's actually one of the big next areas that we need to do some education in. Because, you know, at this point, if you think about what um, the general public understands about various technologies versus what the current state is, there's usually a gap, right? And I think that's very much the case with, uh, with privacy law and privacy policy right now. Um, where we can enable privacy, where we can uh, safeguard it, and what the public understands, there's this gigantic gap right now. And as a result, a lot of people are going, well, actually, I'm not going to do those safeguards because I can make more profit if I don't, right? Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a customer service call with Nest, but it is a it raises the hair on the back of your neck. I have two Nest uh, Protect uh, uh, smoke alarms. One of them wasn't working, so I called Nest. And the guy gets on the phone, he's like, oh, Tom Igo, yeah, you live at such and such address. Yeah, okay, you know that from the database. Oh, um, well, I see that the uh, sensors haven't seen any motion in a couple of days. Have you been home? <laughs> well, yeah. He's like, oh, maybe the sensors aren't working. Hmm, hold on just a sec. Take a look at that one. Is it glowing green? Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, okay, well, that one's working. You know, so he's being very polite and very friendly about it, and he's trying to help me make things work. But the problem is, he's kind of getting in my pants a little bit. <laughs> you know? And so I think what we've really got to start to think about as, as people designing these and as companies making it is we have to think, how would I want my own privacy to be safeguarded in that situation. I don't think it's necessarily a technological problem so much as it is a combination of a design and a social problem. Um, one of the, the fantasy projects that I've been trying to get done for a while now is to take some of these devices we use, like the Nest, and put together a tool that lets you very quickly go through all of the end user license agreements you're signing in the course of using it, not just with Nest, but with all the data providers they're connecting to and so forth down the line. So you can start to see that your privacy, much like the devices themselves, is involved in a very complex network. Um, this is a long answer of saying I don't have easy answers to it, but I think the, the start is education and transparency. Okay. Yeah? So you've been talking about sensors, and I remember many years ago somebody was trying to do something called snow vision. Mm. Are we trying to, I mean, is there a frontier where we're trying to produce sensations in human beings and, you know, with our technology? And so what's going on with that? Oh, yeah, there's definitely some of that happening. Um, I mean, I, I'm frankly quite perplexed at, at things like Oculus Rift. You know, I thought we'd killed off VR in the 90s. Um, but it's back, and it's better than ever. Um, <laughs> and we're seeing similar things happen in haptics. Um, you know, the, the kinds of things we're able to do on phones with just the vibrating motor now to signal things. If you've ever tried to use, say, an iPhone when it's put in the mode for blind people, it's fascinating. Um, and we're writing better and better algorithms for controlling those motors to give you to, to simulate uh, haptic sensation. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of work around that. I think the, the gap right there right now, again, is we can do it. But we need people to come up with the interesting ideas for why we should do it, okay, and what we should do with it. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a couple things. And um, again, I'm biased. Um, but uh, first of all, one of the things we were really trying to do is we weren't making an assumption that you were interested in engineering. Um, we assumed that you just thought that the products of engineering were interesting and you wanted to make your own versions of it. So all along, we've tried to work that way. I think the other thing, uh, we deliberately went cross-platform. And one of the surprising things about that was at a time when the when we started, and, and you know, Mac has a bit more of a market share now than it did then. But from the beginning, we were seeing that our, our customer downloads, instead of following the trends of what actual hardware was, we were seeing 30%, 30%, 30%. We were seeing that there were as many Mac and Linux users as there were Windows users. So that played into it, too. We also actually took a lesson from Parallax and wrote a bunch, a bunch of examples and encouraged the, 
the customer base to do the same. Um, and we got a lot of response from that because of the openness. We had people saying, well, if you're sharing the whole thing, I'm happy to share a few examples. Parallax never really did that till later on. Um, so I think in some ways, they're a good company and they've got a lot of things going in terms of their technologies and they're starting to get some catch up. But I, I don't think they bought into the fact that they had an audience that didn't want to be engineers for a long time. Once they did, they started to play catch up. Uh, yeah. Okay, well thank you guys very much and enjoy the conference. Thank <laughs> you.